Hey everybody, how you doing? Welcome to mid-September 2022. September's been a crazy month for me. Just two weekends ago, I was flying into Denver on a Friday afternoon to go to the Rocky Mountain Arch Top Festival. Now, let's get some business out of the way here. If you're one of my regular subscribers, you know what happens here in the shed. If you are not one of my regular subscribers and you are coming to this channel and this episode by way of a reference to the Rocky Mountain Arch Top Festival and you are a purist, you really, really want to leave right about now because... If you're a purist, you're going to see things here that you probably wish you would never have. I don't want to be responsible for therapy uh, session costs or the nightmares you'll have. So with that warning, you've had ample time. We do crazy stuff in here. We build guitars out of just about anything. Old Mississippi license plates. You're going to love this one. A coffee can. But mostly what we do is we take old, junky, worst of the worst, cheapest of the cheapest, tore up from the floor up, cracked, patched with marble mystery oil, neck broken off guitars, and we put them back together. And we actually put them out into the trash blues world. You'll see my guitars playing in nearly every dive bar you can run across in America and now we're getting into Europe and and who knows what um, every once in a while we'll get a nice one come along if you can call it nice meet the Texas junk pile has come out of a sun baked window in some guitar shop somebody knocked off a Gibson ES 175 somewhere in the 60s and we Took a bunch of yard sale Texas stuff and made this thing play. And it will play, trust me. Um, I'm going to give you a link to it right up here, right about now. Oh, by the way, if you don't know, this is Chick Flick Teal Pointer, star of the show. Anyway, when I do this, there's an episode up here. And most of these guitars have some kind of a history. And you'll see somebody play them. They actually play pretty well. Um, one of the trademarks I have... Uh, something that describes my guitars is they are tough uh, they're durable and they will take traveling all over the place in some of the worst conditions um, I got one here that came back you all know this one is the Archcraft junk pile this was made by K Archcraft but made by K somewhere between 1933 uh, and 1937 it's got that v-neck uh, I got it out of Costa Mesa, had cracks all over the body, the neck was coming off of it, and it had a big hole in the back that we conveniently picked, fixed up by patching it with this. Anyway, it's been out on the road with Troy Murrah, it has been trashed by Troy Murrah, and it has come back to the shop for some things to do. Now, only a purist would understand this, but when you start putting pickups on arch tops, they vibrate and feed back. And some people go to great extents putting sound holes up here, talking about sonic resonance or whatever. The people I deal with just put duct tape over the F holes and carry on. At the end of the episode, I'm gonna give you a little sound bite of what this one will do in the hands of the ever dangerous Troy Murrah of the band Restaurant. So, let's talk about what I did Two weeks ago and why um, like I said my guitars play well um, they look terrible and some people think it's folk art or whatever but if you're gonna build guitars out of junk it gets to a point we have to realize the strings can't be that high they got to get closer to the fingerboard and you start worrying about intonation and things like that. So you all know that watching my channel, we've made a progression towards that. And I'm lucky to have people like Fred Wallachy babysitting me in the background and the tech end. But uh, you mix what I do for a living, which is an arborist. You look at the things that I've studied and write about, and that is 
uh, trees and how they behave in wind and especially palm trees and then consider I was a crane operator and understand loading and engineering to that level. Um, sonic transfer and resonance and these things and these old violins um, that stuff interests me greatly. So um, they have a festival in Arvada. It's not Arvada. It's like Nevada, Arvada, California, outside of, of excuse me, Colorado. Don't hate me for that. Um, <laughs> Arvada, Colorado, which is outside of Denver a bit. And they get together and put together some of the best arch tops you have ever seen. So I flew into Denver uh, two weeks ago today on a Friday. Uh, left LAX first thing in the morning, got in there and attended a three-day festival. Uh, and what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go through that festival and kind of tell you what I experienced there and some of the things that I saw. Now, I might as well get the housekeeping out of the way. If you uh, uh, care to subscribe, uh, give me a like or whatever, make comments. Those opportunities are available to you. Uh, at the end of the episode, there's going to be some playlists, and um, I've got my playlists um, arranged to just about anything. You'll find that we make guitar stain out of uh, eucalyptus trees and oak galls, and I, I mean, there's a, a myriad of stuff that you can watch here. But let's start off with this. I thought LAX was the worst airport in the world. Um, guess again. I'd forgotten uh, when I was uh, in the early 80s, I used to go between Missoula, Montana and Clinton, Oklahoma every a couple of weeks and sometimes I would catch a flight out of Denver. It's very hard to find a flight from uh, anywhere in Oklahoma uh, to Missoula, Montana. It's just difficult. So the times I did fly into Denver back then, I remember wherever you would end up landing, your gate would be here, and then it would be like an O.J. Simpson run uh, Olympic sprint down to the other end of this long, never-ending thing. And, and it seemed like you were always stressed for time. Well, guess what? That hasn't changed. The Denver airport is huge. Um, it is a hub. Uh, I think they're trying to lay it out to where it doesn't become a problem, so it's out of the city a ways. Here's what I'll tell you about flying into Denver. Uh, number one, your first time is going to freak you out because your when you land, you have to take a train to get your baggage, and then you take a shuttle to get your rental car, and then once that's all done, then you go to wherever you're going. Um, as far as the hotels and, and stuff around this festival, uh, great, as long as you book ahead. Um, they sell passes to the festival. They're all access passes, but they only sell a couple hundred. The price of it is ridiculously low, considering that if you take your family out to eat, um, it's easy to drop $150. Um, if you go to any kind of a concert, it's going to cost you that. But the whole weekend, all access pass was uh, less than $200 and um, certainly worth it. And... Um, travel costs, lodging costs. I'll tell you, fuel and, and food costs out, out there in that area are significantly less than Los Angeles. Lodging is reasonable, uh, but you're probably going to put, um, you know, approaching 2000 into the trip, of which, again, uh, 200 is the, the ticket. So if you live around there, it, it's a great value. But here's what the, here's what the airport deal is. If you have any kind of an issue walking, you're going to want to give yourself plenty of time. A lot of walking, a lot of from here to there. Um, if you really don't know what uh, baggage gate your, 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 your air carrier is in, you're going to want to know those kinds of things. But getting back, once you decide, I'm going to go to the airport, you're going to give yourself plenty of time. Little did I know or remember that the day I was returning to LAX was 9-11 course hyped up security it took me a while to get through TSA um, you're gonna see that I stopped at a yard sale and had some stuff in my bag that come out of a yard sale yeah that's that's 
this doesn't just happen. There's a lot of yard sale in here. But anyway, so here's what you got to plan for. You get out of Denver, you got to get to drop off your rental car. Now, your rental car is at least a 10-minute trip, depending on the shuttle and all that, to get from where your rental car is picked up and dropped off to the airport. So it's not just right there. Once you get to the airport, you're going to go through security. You may be in the sea gates, which is way, way at the end. A lot, a lot of walking. So you want to give yourself plenty of time. If you've got to make a connection flight in Denver from one airline to another, kind of avoid that because it's going to be a hassle. I certainly would not send a teenager uh, out there to visit a friend and catch flights by themselves. Certainly not a, a good uh, place to send a child for a visit you are going to want to uh, navigate Denver a couple of times. But that said, don't let it scare you. If you decide to book the festival, uh, do it early because, yeah, it's going to be increasingly popular, you can tell. So that said, I got a lot of the front end stuff out of the way. Now I'm going to give you a little narrative between the little episodes uh, of things I'm going to share with you. You want to remember, I went out there strictly to find out about the technical seminars that were being held uh, uh, by top end people when it comes to high dollar arch top construction and sonic resonance and the science of that. That's why I went there. A lot of other things happen. I'm gonna share a little bit of that with you right now. Okay, so the first thing I want to tell you um, that is probably the biggest thing for people um, that go there. You know that I listen to Hill Country Blues. You know that I like slide music. You know that uh, if it was done uh, by Furry Lewis and that type and that's the roots of it, that's the kind of music I listen to. Um, I do have a little Wes Montgomery and Candy Burrell going on in the record collection but not too much. But I will tell you what, if you go to this Arch Top Festival, this place is crawling with the top jazz guitar artists out there from everywhere. So if you like to sit and have a glass of wine and listen to El Giro, that kind of music, this is your place. This is your place. Um, all through the festival, there are people popping up that can play uh, jazz guitar arch tops like you've not heard before. Let me share uh, one of those performances that popped up during a technical seminar that was being put on by Ken Parker. Let's have a look at this guy. But the other day Ken said something caught my ear. He said, Lucky's not going to the prom. <laughs> he sort of makes a point of having it dinged up because it helps people not feel so uncomfortable about playing it. Guitar that costs so much money. Yeah, ding this one up, not that one. <laughs>
Next, there is an exhibit hall where vendors who sell these high-end archtop guitars are set up. Um, there's no sales pressure. You just walk in and you'll see some of the finest stuff. I saw one guitar there that kind of resembled something like I would do. Uh, it was a solid body, had a couple bullet holes in it. Uh, but for the most part, you're going to see some really cool guitars. Uh, if you're into arch tops, highest quality workmanship. Uh, so let's have a quick look as I walked through the exhibit hall uh, early morning, the second day of the festival. All right, if you get there early enough and you're able to talk to a, a couple of exhibitors, you're going to find out that you have luthiers there that are top notch. I got to talk to a couple, one from Poland and one from Italy. And anyway, let's just have a look at what they had to say about their guitars. I appreciate the time both of you gave me. Look at the quality of the workmanship in these guitars. Let's have a look. Okay, my name is Krzysztof Trzeszniowski, I'm from Poland, I have a small workshop in Warsaw and I brought here two guitars, those guitars are a lot of inspirations from many many luthiers from very old times, for example this tailpiece holder is uh, designed as, uh, as uh, the same way as it was designed for the viola da gamba in, uh, in 1400s. Yeah, the, the tailpiece itself. This is my uh, this is my construction, my design, and this is designed to make sure that uh, that uh, we have a proper length of the uh, of the strings after the bridge. The bridge is hollow. The bridge is made of ebony. That's that's a solid ebony, but solid from the outside, it's emptied. It less it where it's less than three quarter of an ounce. Yeah. The same is for for the uh, for the tailpiece. It's roughly roughly 0.8 ounce. The guitar is very light. It's 3.7 pounds. I have to say that many of the of the reasons why my guitars look like that are because of inspiration from Ken Parker. Ken Parker is my hero. Ken Parker is my my uh, master, and I follow his advices. I follow his ideas. Sometimes I'm stubborn and do my my way. Yeah. So, for example, my guitars does not have any holes in the in the top. We do. I do have hole on the sides, and if you look inside, you can see there is a carbon fiber main beam which holds 100% ten, uh, of tension of the of the strings.
uh, I wanted to free the body of the guitar from the structural function. I think the most important function of the guitar is, of the top and back, is to resonate and not to be a, you know, a beam, structural beam, yeah? So that's why I have that. The, the neck to body connection is similar to what Ken Parker is doing, as I said, my, my, my hero. And I do six in line like Fender is doing, so this is not very very uh, often at the, with the Archdorf guitars, uh, but I believe that there is a reason, good reason for to have that. Okay, the guitar. This is Pau Ferro Iron Wood. It's very difficult material to work with, very heavy, very brittle. I. I cannot tell you how many times I swear when I was working on this material. This is Sitka spruce, very nice, beautiful Sitka spruce. I always choose materials based on the acoustic properties, not very much looking at the, how it looks like. Yeah. For example, this guitar. This is Italian spruce. This is Italian spruce. And I have chosen, in, in spite of the fact that it has a very wide grain here, many people would say no to this guitar, and it has a, it has a, a beauty mark. That's, kind of, that's why I call this guitar Cindy. It has a different, it has a different way how the, the uh, uh, yeah. This part of guitar is designed, but I would probably go to this one for the future. Okay. Uh, I am uh, Fernando Jaén from Spain, and I make uh, these guitars, and one more that's still in the box. <laughs> Well, you're asking me about the bridge, but in fact, uh, these are two different bridges because this is a piezo bridge and this is a um, uh, 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 bridge without a piezo. Uh, and uh, both are different, both are very, very light and uh, they have. Um, I brought bridges here. This is the, the same as this one, and it has a um, carbon fiber core inside it, and the same for the Paiso. So tell me, how long does it take you to make one of those bridges? Um, there's a lot of work, um, hidden, hidden work, because um, you know, um, this is uh, maybe the. Um, I have made more than 10 designs or even more of bridges that didn't work well. So uh, there's a lot of work behind them. And uh, once I have the design, it's not so much work to make uh, those bridges. But. Uh, Tell me about all the work that I did to reach that design. So Let me ask you this. Will you ever be happy with your own bridge or are you, are you always... I don't know. I always think that my last bridge is... Um, I am not going to change it. But then after two weeks, I have changed everything. Yeah, I'm sure, for example, that this thing here that allows to place um, or to raise a pick guard uh, this is something that uh, should be definitive and uh, Mm, I don't know. I'll show you in a year or two. Next year, if you're here, uh, perhaps that's not the same. And maybe it's too different. <laughs> Thank you.
Okay, next thing before I forget, you like this shirt? Great shirt. Um, they're probably available at the website for the festival. You may be able to pick one up. Um, but I did have the opportunity to meet the artist named Andrea who did this design on uh, a woodcut. Look at that. Now, if you attend the festival and buy the All Access Pass, you get one of the smaller ones. But this is a woodcut. It was done on uh, hardwood and linoleum. So, had to have one of these. I'm going to put it on my a piece of wood and uh, hang it next to my Reuben Lacey uh, Bridgecrest California Baptist Church uh, cornerstone rubbing. Good stuff. Anyway. I got a minute with Andrea after I got the print and asked her, tell me where your art comes from. And I learned that Andrea's into trees too. So let's have a little chat with Andrea. Hi, I'm Andrea Antononi uh, and I'm an artist. I live in Arvada, Colorado. And I'm here today at the Rocky Mountain Arch Top Festival selling my uh, commemorative art prints. These are a woodcut. It's, I can't tell you the type of wood. I do know that it's a hardwood because when you carve, you need to have durability and uh, so that it has a lifespan as you reproduce the prints. So this is one of the prints that I made for the, for the festival. And then these are some other special edition prints that I made as well that are in color. And I draw inspiration from wood mostly because I grew up in the woods of Maine. Uh, I uh, lived on a lake. I was surrounded by birch trees, oak trees, uh, and then moving out here, I fell in love with its sister or brother, you might say, the aspen tree. So um, I love to be in nature, and any tree is really my friend. It's been my companion my whole life. So um, I hope that answers your questions, and um, thanks for listening. Okay, so next, there was a movie premiere um, called The Chisels Are Calling. It was about the work of John Monteleone, who is an exquisite archtop builder out of New York City. Now, um, this movie talked about John D'Angelico, Jimmy DeQuisa. Oh, by the way, I've got an episode coming up where we talk about some really cool stuff that all goes back through there. And there's kind of a lineage of stuff that's happening to pop up in my shop. I can't believe I have some of it, the history of it. But anyway, we'll tie that all together. Once that episode is done, I'll get back into this one and give you a link to it. I think it's going to be called What Is It? The arch top with no sound holes. Yeah, very interesting. Anyway, the movie about John Monteleone uh, shows the progression of his work. Um, I sat and watched that the chairs in the theater were like sitting back in a lazy boy. It was a wonderful movie. You're going to want to see it. If there's a link to it somewhere, if it comes out, I will give you that link down in the resource section below. But it's called The Chisels Are calling and I sat there and watched it, a wonderful movie. Orville Gibson combined violin making construction with uh, guitars, F holes and carved or graduated tops. The early Gibson arch top guitars, they were very good, but John D'Angelico took the concept and elevated it to probably the highest level ever. And his protege, James DeQuisto, carried on the D'Angelico tradition John was very influenced by both makers. You know, it's a funny thing about what I do. It's, it's not work. I, I never looked at it as work. I always thought of it like I, I've been retired for the last 45 years. I happen to look forward to every day. I can't wait to get up the next day and get into the project that just left last night. And then I spent a lot of time with my family too. That's always been very important to me. In our house, we had a guitar. It really had not much value and it wasn't in great condition. Nobody played it. And I wanted to know what was inside the guitar. I took it down in the basement one day and there stood a metal column. And I just did a Ted Williams roundhouse. I 
exploded into hundreds of pieces. It just flew on the floor, and as they hit the floor, they would tinkle, and you, know, you hear these little sounds, tinkle, and they sounded musical in their own way. What I began to understand was this idea of resonance in wood, and it led to other things that made sense. Finally, I saved what is the best to me uh, till the end. Uh, day two, first thing in the morning in, in the lecture hall, and day three, first thing in the morning in the lecture hall, we got to listen to some people who know Archtops. Uh, first up was Ken Parker. He has a channel called Archtoppery. Uh, I'm going to give you a link to something he's done up there. If you don't know Ken Parker, uh, or his work, I'm going to give you a link to a, 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 an episode up there where he talks about uh, the history and evolution of the arch top. Um, I actually got to sit there. I actually got there early enough to help Ken Parker set up and deal with some of his guitars and um, actually took a couple of, uh, they were really sacrilegious pictures of me with a slide on one of his guitars. You all know I can't play. Anyway, let's take a look at bits and pieces of the lecture Ken Parker put on. Fascinating. And uh, so this is one of the first, I think it was the third guitar of this new series that I'm working on. Um, does everybody here know something about what I've done and what my work has been in the guitar? Yes? We're seeing yes. yes. Okay, so, so uh, in 2003 I started setting up a new shop uh, after the, my electric guitar company went away. And did this get turned on, Ken? Yep. So, um, and uh, the result is this new recipe, Arch Top Guitar, that I've, I continue to develop. And of course, you're all welcome to come and play them. And Super light. The light is like, is it three pounds? They're three usually pounds? between three and four. Yeah. Yeah. Easy on the back. Right. So, and, and, and old, uh, I think, um, Kit, you, you weighed this uh, 1927 L5 and it's 4.8, was it? 4.8 pounds. So these are lighter than the original recipe uh, lore, you know, period instruments. Um, I feel like I'm off to a little bit of a jumbled start because I don't have my images. But what I'm trying to... What I really want to impart today is that I feel that the art top field is, is in its infancy and um, has a long, long way to develop. Um, and I reject the idea that the best guitars have been built. I think it's absurd. Um, and I think that the, the art top guitar recipe is so good that even when you blow it, it's still pretty good. Just the way a lot of speakers are ported cabinets, the size of the port is super important. It's tuned to the resonant frequency of the box. That's why Martin has five different size sound holes. You don't just cut holes. You have to tune them. And so, you know, to some extent, it's a mistake to make guitars with extra holes and basically the whole sides are missing. And whatnot. I don't want to be a jerk about yeah. holes, but I really don't think it's the right place for them. Holes. I mean, you can feel when you when you build a guitar a guitar like this uh, without those sound holes in between the bridge and the edges of the guitar. You can feel the top is zooming all the way out to the edges, and then it, it helps to drive the sides and the back and everything else, and it lights the guitar up. I think you know. I think the I, the F holes were Lloyd Lore's stylistic addition. I'm not being critical, but I'm just saying I think it was a style decision. Not a, uh, not a performance. And, and, you know, we were showing you pictures of Eddie Lang playing his L4. That's the guitar he, he recorded on. He didn't record on an L5. So. That right there is why I went. Um, the next day, the next morning, um, another great technical seminar put on by Tom Nania. Do you remember I did uh, an episode about 
finishing a guitar with Mississippi clay dirt mud, telling you that I thought it went back to Cremona, Italy, violin maker technique. Well, in this clip, anyway, that episode is right up there. You got to see it to believe it. Potassium silicate and dirt and Mississippi river water. And yeah, um, it turned out great. Anyway, I got to discuss that. Uh, with Tom, but I want you to listen to a little bit of the quality of the seminar. This guy is hanging arch tops in some kind of a stand and using sonic resonance to map out the vibrations and where the stuff is dying. Now, the sound is dying. Um, I am an arborist. I understand how trees uh, divert stresses to avoid harmonious sway frequencies, which blow the tree down and how they move all over in parts and how torsion helps uh, dismiss the wrong kind of loading. Little did I know while I'm listening to this person talk, the same thing happens in guitars and how they sound. Anyway, let's have a little bit uh, of a bit of Tom talking to us and then asking, answering the stupid questions I asked about what happens when you put mud on a guitar body. So I'm an arborist and I kind of look at how trees transfer wind loading. What it sounds like to me in wood, inherent to the wood, is this torsional stuff that's going on is detracting from the vibration. Yeah, that's that's true for, for strings, for example. You have sort of a, a fundamental frequency of a string vibrating. Energy gets pulled away from that to the torsional vibration of a string. At the expense of the quality of the sound. Yeah, at the expense of yeah, the output of, of a different vibrating mode. Yeah. It's, as, a, as a maker, it's sort of frustrating on an F or an archtop guitar because with an ordinary flat top, once you once things completely built and you do testing on it, you can go in through the sound hole with a sharp instrument and, and adjust the bracing. Yeah, I that's think already plausible on an archtop set. No, there are things you can do. A lot of archtop makers will string the guitar up before it finishes on it, and you can scrape wood off of the recurve. That's in one way that's kind of what the recurve is for is, is tuning and you want it to look nice but there's there's also uh, voicing implications there. You could maybe open up the F holes a little bit. Typically when you open up a sound hole that first peak the air resonance shifts down in frequency. I have the most ridiculous story I think you're the only one to give the, give the answer to. I was reading I think maybe something an article you had about um, what they used for the ground material in the early violins. Uh, so I started looking at this, and I'm thinking there weren't too many Ace Hardware stores in Cremona, Italy in 1600. So it dawned on me, maybe they were using dirt. And so I got some Kremer ground mineral, and I actually got clay dirt out of Mississippi, oven dried it, mixed it 50-50, used potassium silicate, and it gave me this wood-like almost like petrified wood. It took oil really well after that. It sounds great and, and you can't push anything through it. Respond to that. Oh, that's, that's very interesting. I think a lot of violin makers, especially historically speaking, did a lot of different things to their finish. There's often the, the uh, sort of the base of it would be rosin, same rosin you put on a bow. You would boil that down and um, then crush it up, make it into a powder. They also would add ash, Sim similar to adding dirt or clay. I'm sure they added clay also. So you're not banking on it that they use Mississippi dirt? Uh, maybe not in Italy, but uh, <laughs> but I don't know. Maybe you're the maybe you're onto something. You're maybe right. I'm <laughs> not. Yeah, yeah. yeah, not a big export product. <laughs> they have your custom color though. That in 200 years, everybody would be wondering how you made that color. They would never figure out. They'd have to is. subscribe to my YouTube channel. <laughs>
of the vehicle automatically. So this car, I guarantee you my deductive power say has not been in Florida any time recently. All right, finally. Again, only in Colorado. You guys know that I go to yard sales and I source this stuff just doesn't just happen. Uh, and so Denver is a pretty big place to say the least. There's a metropolis and you're in these suburbs. So as always, I pick one yard sale. Don't know anything about it. Just drive up and this is the one. You gotta remember, I'm going to get on a plane. So what is there that I can buy that's significant at a yard sale that I'm, I'm going to find at the random yard sale? I'm only going to stop at one. You will not believe this. This is completely and utterly disamazing. Watch this. Hey, guys, you know that I go to a yard sale everywhere I go. And I am headed in to see a presentation about archtop acoustics at the Rocky Mountain Archtop Festival. And I picked out this yard sale. And I'm glad I did because this is a piece of banister from the Golden Hotel in Golden, Colorado. It's old. It's some kind of porous wood. I'm seeing a headstock here. But the most important thing I'm going to tell you right now is... This episode is sponsored by Tay's Famous Lemonade. So, I have been doing this lemonade stand for two years now, and I'm hoping to start and turn this into a business. Oh, I will hopefully be featuring new drinks later on this year, but for now, it is just Tay's Famous Vanilla Lemonade and Snacks. My name is Tatum and I'm having a yard sale in Arvada, Colorado. First thing first, I had to wake up at 7.30 this morning to start a yard sale. Like why, I don't understand. <laughs> and so I was trying to set up my lemonade stand and this guy pulls up. He's just like, we're not even set up yet. Why are you here? And he comes and tells me that he makes guitars out of junk. Yeah, okay. He's like, I'm on YouTube, watch this video. I'm like, okay. And his guitars are actually really cool. Like, out of used license plates and matchboxes. It's really cool, actually. But my dad is just trying to sell him bowls. And he's like, oh, you can use this? Okay, take it, go ahead. Like, I don't understand. It was for us, but okay, there you go. There's a guitar handle. Hi, I am Mr. Tatum's dad. And here's our unset up garage sale. Well, Ken pulled up and was looking for parts for his guitars and ended up getting a couple bowls. And then all of a sudden I realized that I had some banisters that came out of the Golden Hotel in Golden, Colorado. When they redid the hotel, they took these banisters out and they're from the 1800s. So we're gonna take this part off right here at the end and we'll see what kind of guitar it ends up on. All right, Ken, here you go. We'll see how this ends up. Good luck getting it on the airplane. Hope TSA doesn't give you too much trouble for it. All right, can you believe that? So I come back dazed and amazed. It was like, I don't know where the days went. I saw so much. Um, again, if you're into arch tops and you're into jazz guitar music, forget the technical stuff, forget uh, the stuff that I like to do and listen to, you could go there 
and here with an all access pass there's music on all night all day if you like uh arch top jazz music it's worth it just for that but i certainly would go again again i gave you a lot of uh front end information about the airport and how far things apart you really want to make sure that you don't try to cut your flight out too close to where it cuts into the end of the day on the third day that's what happened to me i didn't get to see the blue arch top uh guitar collection that that's a topic all of its own um i did get to catch a bit of the theater discussion of the uh luthiers that made the blue arch tops um if i got a card left i'll give you a link to a, an episode to tell you about these blue arch tops um short of this showing of them um they were in the smithsonian before that so very rare opportunity i didn't get to catch it so i would have extended the flight out into the next day if i could change it now that said we're going to get back onto my world because the old archcraft junk pile is starting to fold in on itself right here so we're going to get inside of this thing and we're going to beef this up and pull the neck off and tilt it back and i don't know if troy can get this back but what we will do is we'll end this episode it's not jazz guitar music guys i told you we're going to catch some video of troy and tyler of R restaurant playing silver dollar surprise on the archcraft junk pile and then he handed it to me and it's back to the shop to try to fix what troy has trashed hey thanks for watching if you enjoy this kind of stuff and you want to escape from the world of perfection and luthery luthery luthierism yeah subscribe and watch my stuff for a while then you'll have a real appreciation for fine guitars thanks for watching i'll see you soon <laughs>